On this thumb drive, I have maybe half a dozen projects I need to cut drums for. Some, I'm just doing the drums. Others, I'm producing a whole record. The song I'm tracking drums for today is a singer-songwriter project called Graveyard Nostalgia, a whole album I'm producing for singer Megan Adriel. The song I have, well, let's take a look and a listen. Was that shaker? More than a year. Oh, there's just so much to say. Oh, but that's asking. Oh, those chords are so good. Megan, you're gonna be happy with this. Part of my process for producing a lot of songs is starting with the right vibe for the rhythm track, and often that actually gets replaced. Once we knew the song we were doing together and the way the song is shaped and it feels, I actually cut a more or less lo-fi drum track. Basically just a, a loop to give us a framework that set the tone and feel for all the rest of the tracks to be built on. Where is the shaker track? There it is. That's going to be used in places, but I want to replace that loop with a fuller drum production. Once that loop was built, we did some core piano tracks, acoustic guitar tracks, I cut a bass line. From there, we actually spent a whole day doing the final vocals. Uh, after drum tracks today, next on the list, it's harmonies and background vocals. We have the whole song here. We have the framework, we have a lot of tracks cut. We have almost everything else finished, so we're gonna focus on the drums. I have a kit set up already. We're gonna double check all those sounds. It's already mic'd, but we need to check levels, check tuning, and see what we're getting, see if we're ready to record this track. So let's jump into that. Even though the kit is already mic'd up, we're actually gonna switch out some of the drums to make it right for this song. First step is getting this new kick drum onto the kit. Uh, I literally just got this in the mail, just custom made for me. It's actually a 20 inch by six inch bass drum, walnut shell. All right, we've got the kick mic'd up and it's pretty straightforward. I stretched the head because it's a brand new head. I stretched the heads on both sides and made sure it was just tight enough to resonate. The point of that shallow depth is that when you actually mic it, there is a ton of low end. It doesn't project as much out to an audience, but for a microphone, it actually sounds really fantastic. So I've got my coffee here that I brewed at home. I hope it's cool enough. Mm. Okay. Nice. And I needed that, that's for sure. Let's see what it does. One thing you'll notice about the kit I have right now is I'm not using any regular crashes on the kit. I have an effects crash, which is actually stacked and it sounds pretty wild. This is from a previous session and I'm actually not worried at all really about setting up crashes for this. The reason why is that I don't like to play crashes in the actual drum takes that I'm using for a song. I almost always want to overdub those so that I can control their volume later. I also have some fun stuff like this is a vintage coin belt actually from Afghanistan. You can find things like this on eBay. 
I really like it on the hi-hat and also on the snare drum itself. Over here, let's see, I've got your usual jiggly stuff. Other than the apocalypse, everything's pretty good. I'm going to play the chorus as it was, basically, okay. and without the bass, just so you hear okay. like the core, second chorus. Okay, now I'm going to take some more stuff out. So this is just the piano part, drums and vocals. Okay. Uh -huh. This acoustic guitar part is playing offset from the piano. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And then we have the bass. Okay, now are you ready for this? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, this is the piano part I added as a kind of like a counter harmony to the vocal. Here you go. Oh, oh I hear it. Those it's two little, gorgeous. when those two chords climb against your vocal, it's crazy. And then That's with the bass. Awesome. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, so that's a little inkling of, of what's going on over here. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's awesome, Dimitri. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. You're incredible. Ah. Hey, it's uh, Mike here. It it's, sounds like you're a like a like a mad scientist, and you have a lab that's just wide open. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you for bringing that really beautiful bright thought into my day. After I got levels and a mic test to make sure everything sounded right, everything was tuned well, then I did a quick rough take to the song to double check the arrangement and feel everything. And my first assessment is that I'm playing a little too heavy on the quarter notes with the hi-hat. That's something I always pay attention to is the way you play your hi-hat in terms of the dynamic shape of the pattern, even if it's something as simple as eighth notes, you have control over the dynamics and articulation of every single eighth note within a bar and what that shape looks like. And so what I'm hearing here is that this is a little too heavy. So it's doing this instead of more bouncy. I'm gonna adjust that and then play a full take of the song. It's not that long of an arrangement. The full song is about four and a half minutes, but I'm only playing for two thirds of that. And I want this hi-hat to be a little more uh, even in dynamics because that pushes the feel forward a little bit more instead of being heavy on the quarter notes. Let's take a listen to this first take. Okay, I've got one full take of the song playing all the parts where I want them to be. Now that I have that really solid, I'm gonna do a second one basically as a backup and see if I can get a slight improvement over the feel in some places and dynamics, that sort of thing. I try to keep the number of takes to the minimum possible to get what I need because I like to keep the spontaneity of what I'm playing and the energy. More than a year, there's just so much to say, but that's asking just 
This lesson is going to be about how you can take the second beat you've ever learned and transform it into something that feels amazing and that sounds professional. And what steps do you have? Hi, Grandma. Hi, Dimitri. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Where are you? I'm at the studio, and you're on camera, kind of. No, I know. I'm joking. I'm actually filming myself teaching. Right, I love you. I love you too, Grandma. Okay, ciao. Ciao. As I was filming the lesson portion of this video, I did get it interrupted a few times, but I did manage to get it finished for you guys. In it, I'm breaking down a whole bunch of details that will help turn any beat you play into something that sounds and feels great. These are the things I'm thinking about when I'm recording drums in the studio. How to play the right drum parts that feel great and enhance the song, and how to do that consistently. I'll put a link to this episode's lesson in the description below, or you can go to my website, click on the store page, and from there you'll be able to purchase the lesson. Megan Adriel's single and album are still in the recording process, and with today's current COVID-19 situation, that process has slowed down. But in the meantime, if you want to check out her music, I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. 
With all that said, I'd love to see you guys stick around for the next videos in this series. Every episode is going to focus on a different song, album, or drum track, and we'll be breaking down everything from the drumming and tuning techniques to miking and mixing and studio production, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to do that thing I've never said before. Please click like and subscribe and all that stuff on YouTube, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.